extremely grateful. We have three more papers. Um, I think the connection between the paper we've just had and the one to follow is kind of so clear that I probably don't need to say anything about it. Um, so could I introduce Tony Fretton? I mean, there is an evident connection, which is that my dear and valued friend Arena has used almost all of my images. <laughs> so, <laughs> this kind of thing happened. So, I'm going to have to cook the material in a slightly different way. Right. No, it's all right. What, can you hear me? You can hear me wrestling with the microphone, but we're not sure. Joel, I think I'm going to break this. Anyway. Well, listen, I am going to cook the material a different way, and I actually always intended to cook the material a different way because, well, you probably know that I make buildings, but I also, maybe you don't know, I'm Professor of Interiors at TU Daft, a position which is a mystery to me, and I wasn't entirely sure until about a year into teaching it that I was Professor of Interiors. So, <laughs> in fact, this became clear when I was on an interview panel for another professor, and they said, I RL interview procedures. Clear enough, Professor Fratton and I said, well, not really. And they said, why? And I said, because I hadn't realized that I was Professor of Interior Design. And they said, best keep that quiet. So <laughs> this is academic life. But the other aspect of academic life is, let's say, um, the interplay between um, uh, the written world concerned with architecture, which I think was so beautifully displayed in Diana and Irina's paper, really, in an exemplary way. On the other hand, with the practice of architecture, with the making of architecture. So, what I'll talk about is um, uh, architecture and experience uh, through the buildings that I've made and start with a project of observation that I've made. And the two, to, I mean, just to give this some structure, it does have structure, but I'll, I'll lose it, I promise you. To give it some structure, it, it's about architecture. Well, let's say architecture and experience, how can a building operate in this area? I'm going to say that it operates in this area by functioning, on the one hand, as a cultural object, by which I mean uh, that, uh, let's say, it's very fabric embodies attitudes toward, towards physical and emotional comfort, status, privacy, display, rituals of use and behavior, inevitably. So it's a cultural object. And in that sense, it's an object which already operates at the level of understanding prior to attempting in the hands of an architect to be an object of communication. And ultimately, in a way that's much more difficult to explain, and I probably won't attempt to, it becomes an imaginative object. And, well, I'll try to explain. Let's say Stonehenge has no known function, and yet it simply doesn't stop people from endlessly reworking it in their imagination. So let me start with some images, if I can. Nope, that's not going to work. Back to the front. Um, I'm going to start with a project of observation, which was called London, and it was from 1990. And I think you know, Scalbert's got the originals of this, I think. Um. <laughs> well, uh, good. good. <laughs> then, then they must be in my cupboard somewhere. But, but Irene, I would wish you did have them. Let's put it that way. Anyway, um, what I'm going to say about these, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk only about certain of these images. Um, I'm going to talk about this image, and then eventually this image. So what I'm going to say is something that I've written, so I'll read it, and I'll paraphrase it. Um, the houses that this photograph shows have passed through 
hundreds of hands and minds, and as they were copied, copied and modified from earlier houses, and then altered physically and in the imagination of those who lived in them. And this process is a cultural process that entrains technical developments and is inflected by a kind of storytelling. Um, for example, uh, the reworking, as Diana has shown, of houses in novels, newspapers, film, television, advertising, all those media which take invented stuff and break it up and turn it into a much more understandable stuff. Um, and I think what that gives, when we set aside the somewhat sometimes highfalutin explanations, explanations that architects will often offer, what it gives is a faulty but workable understanding, which is like a folk knowledge that inevitably externalizes general beliefs and touches on the question of our place in the world. So, for example, here, this window, absolutely long established sash window. Um, the builder's rule of thumb would have determined the proportions of those windows over a period of time to make them not too wide so that they didn't jam. But, but in the end, the proportion of that window is a, is a human proportion, it's a vertical proportion. And the layout and widths of streets in a traditional city, which is a format that been developed over centuries. Um, suits traffic, obviously, um, gives reasonably good daylight, but it also places your neighbours across from you at the kind of distance where they can be acknowledged without communicative eye contact. And um, the other aspect is that human occupation is represented in these facades in a way that tells you what's expected of you in a public space and on a domestic street. So I'll turn to this image. I mean, this is a, let's say, building as architecture as a cultural object. Um, there's another way that I think buildings work, and I think they work in a way that's far more uh, far more subtle and sophisticated than one imagines. I mean, if we look at this image, we know that the high rise, we know its genesis from modernism, we know all of that. We know the way that highways became this, we know its architectural story, but, but looked up at another way, from another way, it's, um, it's turned out, the, turned the traditional street inside out, and we know that, but, but it's directed our gaze away from each other, away from a believable society, um, out to the uh, ecosphere, which increasingly is the subject of concern, that now we can't but be conscious of where we are in the world. So this little series of slides is to give you some indication of how I see buildings before I move to another project. Um, <laughs> All right, I seem to have fixed it good. Anyway, um, I'll have to point. Um, this is a project called um, Lordy. What's it called? Faith House. This is a, a small building, as you'll see in a second, that we finished a while ago in Dorset, um, and it's a building that is concerned with people with disabilities, work with people with disabilities, and it consists primarily of. Uh, oh, Joel, you've got another pointer, seriously. All right, got it, I got it, I got it. All right, here we go. So two rooms, a little room there for quiet contemplation and a larger room there. Thanks, Joel. Yeah, okay. Thanks. And a larger room there. Not, I mean, not excessively large, seven meters by seven. Um, and um, there's also a series of entrance spaces, porch, place where you wait there's glass in there, and then there's WCs and stuff like that. And this building's approached, maybe you can see on this drawing, it's approached from a road that, that comes in from the street very, very far from the, 
from the road. And by the time you reach this, uh, you're on a site where your mind is, uh, and your eye is uh, influenced very strongly by the scale of the surrounding countryside. This is, um, wow, this is, um, it's an area which um, on this side is mainly uh, forest and uh, lawn and a small farmhouse here. And then from here, there's arable fields, um, animal fields, which lead down to Pool Harbour. There's no direct view of the sea, but if you drive into those fields, you can see it. So um, what are we doing here? Well, I'll seek to show you. Um, this is the building in reality, and it's very consciously placed so that that road that I described ceases in the car park to be a road and becomes a path that you walk on so the me means of transport is altered to a human rather than a mechanical one and um, it uh, hang on, lost my way here um, it presents itself in a particular kind of way it presents itself as both an abstract object and yet it has reminiscences of a temple or a an industrial building. And there's a, a definite ambiguity at play in this and all other work that I'll show you. And that ambiguity is, I think, something that I've been working for a long time, which is that it does allow uh, reimagination of buildings that we make by other people, and therefore it does qualify as an object of imagination. And this porch area um, starts to generate or gives the kinds of spaces that I'm hoping to describe in a little bit more detail. Um, it's interesting that Irina said that, uh, talked about rooms for the contemplation of the natural world which were enclosed and had their collection inside them. And this actually, this and the porch that I'll show you in a second are places I want to say uh, where you contemplate the natural world. But it, this building contains no objects, it um, contains people. And so the content the contemplation of the world of the views outside. So I'm not entirely sure I can develop that thought, but I'll share it with you. Now, the small room is in a way much more directly um, emotive or emotional in its um, organization. And the, this um, group called Holton Lee are, um, well, they're, what would you say? They're communitarian Christians. Um, so they uh, wanted an element of religious use in this building. Now, I don't have a religion, um, not in their sense. And um, so we were, uh, let's say, asked to make something where I had no experience. And so I had looked a lot at uh, Sigurd Leverance's um, woodland cemetery. And there was an appeal in that cemetery by Leverance to a fictional world, a fictional pagan world before Christianity. I don't want to suggest this is at the level of Leverance. I'm saying that the ideas that I observe in Leverance may be at play here. But I mean, this isn't unusual. If you think of um, Louis Kahn, he makes, I think, an appeal to a pre classicism that never existed. So it's a fiction, a necessary fiction, and in a way, or religions demand a necessary fiction. And it has a, a ring, a circle of trees in it. And these were done, let's say, uh, through my mind as an inventive person rather than through an intellectualization of it. And I neglected to say at the beginning of this lecture that, that in fact, what I'm saying now are things I've learned after making the buildings. And I certainly don't make buildings with, in this formulaic way. So that needs to be understood. So I'm going to venture a, a, an observation about this circle of trees. I mean, um, it could be, well, it's intended. It's intended as an open symbol. It's intended as a symbol without any uh, meaning at all. It's intended to be as available as possible to people for their own personal interpretation. But so in that sense, I'll allow myself to interpret it from my point of view. So it's perhaps about mortality. If you think of, um, uh, a tree. A tree uh, uh, is a living organism and then is cut down and continues in the world as an organic, non sensor um, object, uh, as a structure of a house or a window frame. In this, but in this particular uh, presentation, it's dead, but it, you can see its 
former life and in a way if you think of the relationship with human beings um, uh, when we die we're taken away and our bodies disappear so in a sense there is some underlying um, uh, uh, ideology at work for me in this um, and this shows it from the outside it's set back from the field here that's behind um, a little bit and the room that I'll show you next is actually on the border of the field and we used or I used this position as a positioning of this building at the junction between cultivated and uh, and the arable land as a as a as a means of representation, as a way of taking people to a place where uh, they could feel a different sense of the world, a more reduced form of the world in a way. So this looks out onto this field and these windows open to the floor. Occasionally you can have a meeting in here or an art exhibition and animals will come in and be a complete bloody nuisance, which is what I wanted. So. Um, and again there's a, a blind which can give you a different relation with the outside world but um, a lot of this comes from observing other buildings, Saxon churches for example which don't open to the world but have a certain plainness or for example um, the mosques that I saw in uh, Istanbul where my attitude to Islam was completely altered. Instead of it being a violent religion, it seemed to me, by the way that the mullahs sat in windows that looked to the outside world, a far more, um, well, let's say, a, a religion in the world. And for me, that's an interesting thought. So, again, um, what am I doing here? I hope you are following me. Um, yes, let me just go back. Um, okay, so again, another space in which somebody might spend a moment, uh, this place and that place, which in a pragmatic sense is a sun porch to another building, unconnected to us, but part of the operation of Holton Lee, a kind of um, disabled person's hotel, a sun lounge, where occasionally this door can be opened, occasionally they can use it from this direction, but most of the time, like the door in a southern European church, it's frustratingly closed, but um, again, a place in which um, a relationship of scale between yourself and the outside world is worked. And sadly missing from this are two murals which uh, are in design by an artist called Diego Ferrari, who was uh, uh, funded by the RSA to make these ceilings, and they are a photograph of a tree canopy. So they would, I think, in the end, have um, uh, something I'm very interested in, the depiction of nature, an actuality of nature, and the framing of nature. But it's to do, I think, in the end, with the building's capacity to represent the world to you in a specific way, so that, let's say, an experience can be had of it of some depth. Now, you may have seen this building before, um, slightly earlier. Um, the Red House. Uh, as Arena has said, it was a house designed for a young art collector. Um, and in a different way, but let's say, it's concerned with the same problems as Faith House, that's the connection between the inside and the outside, the inside world and the outside world. And the facade's a key player in this, and uh, it's not for nothing that I looked earlier with you at uh, bay windows and that kind of space, which um, let's say, offers itself. It's within the curtilage of this house, and yet it's given to the street. That gesture is a deeply known gesture for many centuries, so that's a fundamental. But also, uh, in a curious way, the street, which is tight street, is um, a street with very little qualities. It's a place of um, historical significance. Oscar Wilde was ruined there, the house next door in a rather interesting way. I'll just digress a bit. This house was originally the um, studio of Whistler, but Whistler, Whistler's architect Godwin was um, set upon by the Metropolitan Board of Works, the planning authority at the time, for making it too abstract and was made to modify it. And eventually Whistler, I think, had a lawsuit with Ruskin, which he lost, so he lost everything, including the house, and the house was the studio was then bought by 
a rather more vulgar artist who subsequently, then subsequently in the 60s, passed into the hands of um, Colin Tennant, the impresario, who ripped it down um, to his regret, I hear, and replaced it with a house in concrete. I'm told I hadn't seen it, which was in the style of the 60s. And then in the 90s, a developer called Richard Collins, who's rather a sort of gentleman, a celebrity developer, like a celebrity chef, um, discovered that without the need of planning approval, he could put this kind of renaissance facade on the outside, which he did to the intense annoyance of the planners. And then Mrs. Thatcher looked like she was going to buy it. We were very, very pissed off while we were building this building, but then she went away. So let's say we did, do make, we did make an urbanistic connection between this and this. I mean, there is a, let's say, neither good nor bad attitude here. But to get to the point, what we're aiming to do here is to make something of what occurred by chance, which is this slight bend in the road in a street which hasn't been urban planned, which is a kind of zoo of um, buildings by medium range architects. We wanted to make something of it. And at this bend of the road where here there's a, an incoming road, we used these, let's say, very err uh, qualities of alignment and line simply as a, an underpinning for the facade. And, and chance, let's say, interests me. Chance as a cultural phenomenon interests me. And in the Listen Gallery, the view outside is about looking at what occurred by chance. But as Duchamp said, there isn't really any chance. You make your own chance. And chance is a deep operation of culture, its ability to do good things and bad things. But just to finish this point, in that alignment, this side, all of this aligning with this building, and then uh, that and the alignment, which is an accident of street layout, we develop from this side a very powerful um, three-dimensional sense, which is very surprising. And as you approach this building, it opens up, and there is a physicality and three-dimensionality to it, which uh, I'm interested in using to, from time to time, bring the viewer back to a sense of uh, physical fundamentals in the world. But I also want to talk about the way it's a fenestrated building. And this is an old-fashioned format in comparison with modernism, which demanded a huge degree of transparency between the inside and the outside. And in Holland, where I teach, that transparency, for example, in the work of Rem Koolhaas in the Educatorium or in the, um, in the Konsthalle, uh, is something I, I deeply object to, because it pictorializes the public as object. And for me, I'm very interested in this kind of interior where a human being, where an occupier can, in the middle of the room, observe the world outside him without being seen. And in being close to the window can be neighborly, just in the way that I've described. So this um, is what this building is, and some of our other buildings are doing. And it's also, being so large, this is the first floor room, which is six meters high. Um, it's it turns out to be a space where you can occupy it in different points. In the center, it's very intimate. By the window, it becomes something else. So it's, it has, it's a single space, presented as a single space, large and imposing, and able to contain two very large artworks, but also a place with its own internal geography. And um, it's the bay window. I mean, the bay window has no functional justification. And the formation of this house is very different from a modernist house. A modernist house, the, the heritage of a modernist house is that each room has a discrete function. There's no more rooms than are necessary. This building is much more uh, occupied with an older form of housing where you had a number too many rooms with uh, functions that weren't de defined which rooms which suggested and invited use. And um, so the bay window is part of that. And this bay window, you could sit in, you could read, and yet, of course, it's, it, it's uh, as symbolic as it is uh, functional, and it gives an oblique view of the river. Um, now, if the, the, those floors that I've shown you are concerned with uh, the relation between public and private, the, bathroom on the roof and the dining room that projects into the garden are an absolutely different type of space, much more private, much more to do with sensuality. And 
it's difficult to see from this. I wonder if I can just show you another image which may make it clearer. But before I, before I lose this image, it's a garden pavilion that projects into the garden. The trees and the columns uh, rhyme. The ceiling, by the way, is painted by Mark Pimlop. Um, let me try. Nope. Sorry. Let's go back. Um, uh, yes. So, what I want to say. Everything's completely out of order. So, this is the roof space. Um, the objective here hasn't been realized yet. But by the way, this is a hot tub on the roof. Um, if you're rich, you have to have a hot tub on the roof and a garage that can take a Maserati with a stone door. This is what you have to have. But anyway, um, but it's, uh, the objective here will be that all of this, this is a, a courtyard on the roof. Along here is Tight Street. And the bathroom that I just showed you looked out. That's the corner of the hot tub. Maybe this will give you an orientation. That's a, a um, a sink by Mark Pimlock, a see-through sink by Mark Pimlock. And um, this, uh, the bedroom, the main, be the main bedrooms are located around here. The, ob the objective here is that all of this would be planted, that the architecture of the building would disappear, that the relationship between this space and the bedroom would be that it would be one continuous dream space. We haven't achieved it yet, but it's, that's the longer term intention. Now I'll finish very briefly with some images for the embassy that we're doing in Warsaw. And I was asked Diana to, by Diana to put these in. I'm unsure because the, let's say, this building is in the process of being designed rather than having been designed and it gives me no time to reflect on it. But I'll, I'll show you some of what we're doing and I'll finish on a note which I think uh, draws a lesson from it, even though we're in the process of working on it. So the, the project in Warsaw where it is in Warsaw in Poland, is to put a new embassy and a new residence on a site, which is here. And it's in a street of, um, uh, well, a villa district, if you will. Over here is the um, Polish Prime Minister's house with the deep garden. It's uh, the sort of St. John's Wood or Hampstead of, of Warsaw. Over here, building is about six or seven stories high, effectively the edge of the center of the city. So we decided to establish a domestic classical scale. And this is not tall. I mean, this is only three floors high, maybe 10, 12 meters high. So it will have some of the scale of Mises buildings in, um, for example, Cuba, kind of long and very low, uh, oddly, oddly scaled, intentionally so. And it will have an alignment with this building here. This building here is the Swedish embassy, an existing uh, Polish neoclassical house, rather good, um, painted stucco. And these three buildings form the sides of the entrance courtyard, which is the formal entrance to both the embassy and the residence. This view from the back shows something of what we're trying to achieve. It's on the one hand, two known objects, a ribbon office building and a large country house, a house which draws on the experience of tight street in its making, and yet it has, let's say, unlike the other embassies that I've seen currently been, being built in, in Warsaw, this will light up the night, this will make the area around it warm, this will give its interior to the street. And for example, here, in this top two stories, which are an attic story, all of this is the accommodation of the embassy, that floor will have a ceiling lit from an uplighter, very visible from the street. That ceiling will be decorated to a pattern devised by my office in just the same way as uh, Robert Adam would do it. So it's a building which takes forward what we had hoped to achieve in the Red House, which is uh, a luxury building, which gives itself back to the public realm at the level of sight. And um, my slides are inevitably out of order, but um, as I say, it's a building which um, is uh, full of light, and in the daytime it will be a building that receives light. The winter in Warsaw is very long, it's very dark, 
uh, this facade would be heavily glazed. This is an interesting, difficult thing to do because after September the 11th, uh, all embassies now have to withstand um, blast attacks. And so we can do this. The facade engineer working on it was the facade engineer of uh, Port Cullis House by um, Michael Hopkins, so it can be done. Um, but it's going to be a very interesting uh, visual problem in the end. And I'll finish. I'll finish now on the uh, residents in the embassy. The residence is evidently, clearly to me, an 18th century um, big house with a, a large room in there, which I'll show you in a second, and bedrooms above. The configuration is entrance spaces and ambassador's private quarters looking away from the embassy, a large entertaining room, an ambassador's study, and then guest rooms. This is the place where Cherry Blair escapes to when Carol Kaplan is exposing her to the red tops. This is the place where Blair comes to meet Leslie Miller. This, these are very interesting spaces. The embassy, as you have probably begun to see, is an absolutely standard um, ribbon office building. And it's actually, although this wasn't our prior objective, it is the most efficient embassy that's been built for years. So, but from our point of view, its typologies interest me. And always in the work we do, some central issue arises. And here it's to do with um, typology as, uh, as an embodiment of cultural attitudes and as having the potential as a, an imaginative object. And I'll finish on two interiors, since I think this is one of the subjects that we're talking about here. This is a model of the interior of the residence. This is the model of the interior of the embassy at the end that faces the courtyard. And I neglected to say that while the facade of the embassy will be curtain wall, it will be ornamented in a way that I'll describe in the lecture that I'm giving in November at the Court of Institute. So I won't talk about that here, but it, the end of that building contains a double height space while the facade that contains it continues to be absolutely regular. Uh, and it presents a room to the courtyard through a low window, not modelled here, which looks across to this space. And in here we have a kind of civic, uh, uh, a civic gathering where traditionally in embassies you have anything from the signing of a record deal by Robbie Williams to a sensible art exhibition. Here you have um, a space of representation. And I'll, before I close, I'll just digress with the story. We, we have to work with the government art collection. The government art collection is that body which, uh, yeah, which, um, I'll, be, I'll be quick, which um, collects art for embassies. And what is very interesting is that the art that we will put in here with their help has a dual function. It's art, but it's also uh, conversation pieces. It has meaning in relation to the surrounding world. And that is an aspect of these projects, which I hope to develop and talk about later. It's representational quality. Thank you. I mean, I hope it's kind of clear how we had seen these papers going together. Um, but certainly, we felt it was important, um, actually, to have some, somebody involved in the making of buildings talking very directly about the decisions that are made in their making. I, I failed to give the title of Tony's paper, which is Architecture and Physical Experience. Um, Helen mentioned that Soane's house is kind of at that moment where character as decorum 
begins to become character as expression. But I think what you showed very clearly was that that expression is extremely bound up in physical experience. And um, Patrick Lynch now is going to talk about ambivalent character. Again, this relationship between character that merely speaks and character that's directly experienced. Thank you. Um, I missed Diana's introduction because I had to go to the loo, but did you mention that I teach as well as practice as an architect? Um, but I'm on a sabbatical, so I'm not teaching at the moment. But what I'm going to do is try to draw out some relationships that influence um, the work I've been involved in as a, as a teacher and as a practicing architect. And so some of the questions which have um, been alluded to throughout the conference, I think, are um, going to be repetitive, but I hope with a slightly... Um, nuanced and temperamental interpretation of the question of character in the architecture implicit with this within this is um, an interest in the Baroque which um, informs my own um, uh, architectural character I suppose and so part of the, the, the Baroque rhetorical um, tradition is a hubristic um, proposition and it involves exaggeration in order to attempt to tease out paradox. And I think it's probably common for a young architect to be slightly overly emphatic in their um, defense of things which they're still working out. So unlike the um, magisterial, um, laconic and confident um, way in which Tony spoke, I'm, go I'm gonna read, I'm afraid. And I'm going to propose the, the conceit of uh, the, the, using the phrase amb ambivalence to try to deal with what I think is a paradoxical situation in regards to phrases such as the, the public and the private, which are often seen in opposition. Ambivalence um, is the coexistence of two strong and conflicting states or emotions. Although it is often misunderstood to mean nonchalance or carelessness, ambivalence in architecture may be a means to question the dominant view of architectural character as the fixed expression of a single use and the reductive description of the characteristics of spatial settings as functions. Unlike objects, whose status can be given numerical value and which can be quantified, buildings and gardens are inherently situational in character. The way we encounter things is tied to the activities in which we are engaged. The situational character can change dependent upon the events and atmospheres that structure our experiences of spaces. Both modernist and postmodernist architectural theory attempts to codify the events that occur in cities as functional programs, at once misrepresenting the changeable and temperamental character of human actions in quasi-scientific description of inhabitants as users, condensing the complex spatiality of city life into distinct typologies of discrete public and private realms and also confusing time with space, reifying indistinguishable movement and petrifying chance. My paper proposes an ambivalent character for architecture as an alternative to the tautology of cross-programming on the one hand and complexity and contradiction on the other. In order to fulfill this heuristic proposition in 20 minutes, I shall try to expose the historical elision made between character and type via functionalism and then to counter a semiotic view of architectural character with the example of the symbolic character of some Renaissance spaces of intimated civility and urbane cultivation. Function is first used by Duon to describe architecture and design in the most precise possible relationship to economics as the primary action of a designer. The lexicon of building types which Duon reproduced in his DIY Gartop Architectural Education, published in Paris in 1719, 
Attempts to reduce creativity to the reproduction of pre-existing and fixed notions of human habitation and the careful accommodation of this in easily recognisable form. Functionalism and its attendant representational impulse. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Um, functionalism and its attendant representational impulse towards self-expressionism, which both one described after Duan as typological character, conceived of design as the arrangement of rooms and corridors into a simple and, if possible, symmetrical plan form, and the subsequent expression of these functions as easily recognisable conventions. Duan's rationalisation of architecture emphasises non-specific problems. The character of buildings, their meaning, was not a specific problem, Perez Gomez claims. Character and function could be seen as a universal and homogeneous concept, unrelated to site or client. In his opinion, it was enough to solve adequately the disposition of the plan based on the work's intended use, in order to produce buildings which could be perceptibly different from those designed with another programme. Duan was incapable of understanding character in its symbolic sense, the way it was viewed by his immediate predecessors. To his way of thinking, character was nothing but a sign, or the result of a direct mathematical relation postulated between the final form of the building and the organisation of its plan. The architect's only concern should be to achieve the most useful combination of the different parts of the building and plan. No architectural decoration will be pleasant, unless it sprang from the most convenient and economical disposition. Here is the direct precedent of 20th century functionalism, which is still present today in explicit and disguised forms. On the other hand, Renaissance architectural theory utilised rhetorical figures such as ellipsis, the remo removal of a pattern, and abruptio, interrupting a pattern, and recovered the ancient belief in an explicit connection between constructed reality and poetics. Architecture united mathematics and optics, knowledge of the visible and invisible realms of reality, with poetics, the articulation of presence, and the revelation of their relationships and hierarchies. Architecture, as a mode of poetics closely related both to rhetoric and painting, was considered the art that discloses how and why things fit together well. From Alberti, the Temple of Solomon was discussed at the same time as methods of gathering building materials to a site. History and myth was discussed at the same time, and they offered a precedent of wisdom, considered as an example of virtue, and for a patron to build meant to exercise piety and to partake in the drama of creativity in imitation of Solomon. Alberti did not seek to copy Solomon's temple as if its morphology and uses were predetermined. For example, the Palazzo Rigoli in Florence extends a domestic realm into the colonnade of the piazza. Extending also the representational capacity of the building to express the powerful character of the architect's patrons, the Rigoli family. And also alluding to the literary recreation of a mythic stoa the transformation of the contemporary con context into an imaginative and political setting. The spatial configuration is a prompt towards particular and general actions associated with typical situations. The architecture was key see, conceived of as a stage for the enactment of events in the calendar of the city. Its character is festive, that is, essentially incomplete, partial and ambivalent, both enabling and encouraging habitation and use whilst amplifying the imminence of a state of theatrical transformation implicit in Renaissance popular life. The simultaneously public and private character of Renaissance domestic architecture suggests a topographic and territorial reading of space that counters the figure ground and taxonomic tendencies of modernist theory. Robin Evans suggests in his essay, Figure, Doors and Passages, that the subdivision of a house into discrete served and serving routes and rooms is a modern phenomenon. He cites Alberti, who considered that it is also convenient to place the doors in such a manner that they lead to as many parts of the edifice as possible. Evans describes the Villa Madama by Raphael and Sangolo as a network of relationships between people and spaces. As in virtually all domestic architecture prior to 1650, there was no quality distinction between the way through a house and the inhabited spaces within it. From the circular central court, there were 10 different routes into the villa's apartments, none with any particular prominence. Once inside, it is necessary to pass from one room to the next to traverse the building. Thus, despite the precise architectural containment offered by the addition of room upon room, the villa was, in terms of occupation, an open plan, relatively permeable to the numerous members of the household. All of them, men, women, children, servants and visitors, were obliged to pass through a matrix of connecting rooms, where the day-to-day -day business of life was carried on. 
With the rule of Italian palaces, villas and farms, the hardly affected the style of architecture, which could equally well be Gothic or vernacular, but which was most certainly affected the style of life. Evans goes on to connect the development of modern art academic architectural theory with general trends towards the comp compartmentalization of life into distinct zones of public and private, objective and subjective realms. Company was the ordinary condition and solitude the exceptional state. He concludes, the matrix of rooms is appropriate to a type of society which feeds on carnality, which recognizes the body as a person, and in which gregariousness is habitual. It would be foolish to suggest that there's anything in a plan which could compel people to behave in a specific way towards one another, enforcing a day-to-day -day regime of gregarious sensuality. It would be still more foolish, however, to suggest that a plan could not prevent people from behaving in a particular way, or at least hinder them from doing so. Evans suggests that function and type cannot be relied upon to induce behaviour in inhabitants, implying that modernist architecture suffers from too much prescriptive functionalism on the one hand, and not enough character on the other, whereas postmodernist architecture inverts the dictum form follows function, replacing ergonomics with semantics. The capacity for transformation of architectural character enables us to consider character to refer to personae rather than personality or fixed character type. The example of the villa is both mutable and temperamental, a theatrical setting and a microcosmic representation of both city life and rural cultivation. As well as operating as a repository for art, a villa enables architecture to act in tandem with artworks, elaborating our sense of identity and the mutable character of rural and urban, public and private, mundane and ideal settings. Celia expanded the representational program of architecture to incorporate the creation of garden theatres, made up of fragments of walls, stairs, caves, grottos, natural and supernatural realms, coexisting in imagination and play, suggesting the potential transformation of life into festival. A staircase, a staircase Belvedere is ambivalently, ambivalently also a stage and a courtyard too. The Vatican Belvedere Court was the prototype of such Cinquecento gardens as the Villa Lante or the Villa Farnese. It connects the garden and the villa both physically, enabling movement and performances, and emphasizes the cultivation of potentialities that extend as far as the eye can see. For example, at the Villa Lante, the progression from uncultivated nature to the triumph of art is the explicit basis for the garden's iconographical program, Terry Comito claims. The humanist garden articulates literary and painterly themes elaborated in the frescoes of the interior. In the loggia overlooking the garden, the patron, Cardinal Gambada, is depicted as Hercules, performing four of his labours. Implying priestly devotion and patronage can be compared to Cicero's poem on the two senses of cultivation. The slopes of the site are articulated through the flow of water and the curls of verdant topiary. The Renaissance Villa emphasised the increased importance of corporeality and perception over the abstracted and textual space of medieval cloister gardens. Texts are made spatial in drama, and Renaissance theatricality, like antique tragedy, established the spatial conditions of congruence of cosmic, natural and political concerns. Both phenomenal and imaginative, the Villa operated as a gateway, figuratively and metaphorically, between the city and the countryside. The Villa Lante extends the town into a space in which both the mind and the body are rejuvenated through laughter-inducing fountains, exhibiting an Ovidian capacity for transformation. Terry Comito asserts that, in the Renaissance garden, cosmic order is not something to be decoded by a process of abstraction. It is realized, made actual, in the stuff of the physical world, in sights, sounds, odors, textures. The Bosco and water gardens combine to create a setting for vision to attain an orderly experience which articulates humanist dialogue, situated in the real world, and it is essentially situated incarnate. Yet the villa should not be considered solely an epicurean endeavour, despite the deliciously carnal sensuality of a recreated golden age. Trees running with honey, cool arbours, ardour inducing nymphaea. Villa gardens presented themselves ideologically as sites less of holiday or escape than of homecoming. They were places where thought comes home to itself, Comito insists. Whilst the villa can be said to exhibit painterly and literary rather than textual space, its architecture is scopophilia in both a perceptual and an analogous sense. Things are brought to appearance there. 
Visibility is sought simultaneously in what the eye and mind perceive to be there. And often jokes and tricks combine to confuse the other. How we see and think is made visible for the first time as an achievement of individuality and of human capacity generally. The villa is not seen as a reproduction of a timeless archetype, but in its contingency, its historicity, as the creation of human power and imagination. An instance, in fact, of that capacity for self-creation, self-cultivation, an instance which marks the beginning of modern consciousness. Perspective unites house and garden in a narrative completion of imagined, intimated and ritualistic space. What is involved, Comato suggests, is a shift not merely in design, but in the cognitive style of the gaze with which the world is regarded. Renaissance villas and palaces reveal that the function of a building program can be understood to mean more than its use understood in ergonomic and economic terms. Architectural character is not only the expression of use, but can also be the representation of an ethos. Cosmic and erotic, phenomenally rich and intellectually complex, gregarious and secretive, the ambivalent character of a villa opens the architectural imagination to paradox. At once comic and serious, a villa is didactic in the manner of satirical and utopian literature. For the imaginative, the many best-breasted statue of Diana of Ephesus at the Villa d'Este is used much more than simply called drinking water or merely one's own mother's milk. It's as if the amazing fecundity of nature seems to swell up in this place and pour out. Similarly, art and nature commingle in the city palace, the Sphinger Garten in Dresden. In the sunken water garden of the Nymphenbad, techniques developed at Versailles and Vienna were used to create a grotto waterfall. This subterranean nymphaeum is filled with moist air from the fountains, and at lunchtime the sunlight penetrates a reversed arch over the Francaisia Pavillon. The mixed metamorphic realm of watery air and slick earth become mist. A rainbow is released, revealing a hidden dimension of reality and disclosing the essentially symbolic character of architectural space. Hydraulics and art combine to elicit the mimetic capacity of architecture to refer to something other than itself. Now, um, to conclude, I'm going to um, open this um, historical discussion to try to bring in some ideas from contemporary art practice um, and also um, to try to unite speculatively some thinking from the work of the um, uh, recently deceased German philosopher Gadamer with um, some thinkings about um, ambivalence in the writing of Freud. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a film which I'm going to talk over because what I'm hoping to do here is to bring together things which um, often um, are elusive and, and, and very difficult to describe in language, which I think is one of the points that I'm trying to make here. The function of symbolic character can be said to be the revelation of reciprocity between different phenomenal and analogous states. Unlike signs, symbolism can be successful without the need for an explicit referent. The ambivalence of symbols, their uncanny quality of fragmentary incompletion or ellipsis, requires memory and imagination to complete them. A symbol is essentially temporal, a promise of renewal, Hans Georg Gadamer suggests. A symbol is also mysterious, mixing premonition and recognition in a movement towards consciousness and unconsciousness, memory and anticipation. All art of whatever kind always speaks the language of recognition, Gadamer paradoxically claims. In his study of E.T.A. Hoffman's story, The Sandman, Sigmund Freud argues that the uncanny or unfamiliar brings us closer to the familiar. Heimlichkeit, or familiarity, develops in the direction of ambivalence until it coincides with its opposite, the uncanny or the familiar. Ambivalence invokes delay and dramatic temporality. It evokes a state of becoming. Architectural ambivalence exposes contradictions which resist the capacity of logic to impose language upon perception and reveals the paradox that afflicts both vision and thought, that we construct our images of reality and the ways in which we see, and that this simultaneously affects us. Just as a musical instrument is temperamental and needs to be retuned in each climate in order to play the same piece of music elsewhere, architectural character is contingent and heuristic an encounter between here and there. Renaissance villas were not imitations of antiquity. 
but instead emphasize qualities of the natural world and of human perception. We en are encouraged to see through a fresco to the cultivated and cultured space of a villa within which architecture and art are situated as an instructive and exemplary mode of experience. Understood in this way, contemporary architecture can continue to engage with the didactic program of a villa whilst exhibiting an ambivalent character. Diana Periton, reflecting upon a recent project, suggests that it was through proposing different modes of time that the High Renaissance Villa explicitly sought to transform its visitors, however temporarily, in rooms lined with frescoes, mixing images from classical myth with the contemporary reality of the villa's surroundings. Guests participated in real-time events that were choreographed to refer directly to the immortality of mythical time. In the gardens, they were plunged into settings which harnessed and exaggerated the perpetually regenerative power of nature, leaving life's constant everyday negotiations meant being drawn into cycles of change, both mythical and natural, which transcend immediate human concerns. At Marsh View, there was no suggestion of myth, and nature was left untouched. Rather than immersing yourself in alternative modes of time, you experience something of a standoff, and nature was left untouched. You become acutely conscious of time itself and its endlessness, as it moves sometimes fast, sometimes slowly. The house neither envelopes nor rejects, provides a setting for the endless spread of time and of the limitlessness of the landscape to be made palpable. It is like a stage, as Alison Mitchell, the client herself, suggests, on which one's own owns actions, however banal, are starkly delineated in relation to time and place. While you empty the fridge, take out the rubbish, check that the windows and doors are locked, you sense that the house tensely, actively awaits the next performance. In conclusion, I'd like to suggest that architectural character is ambivalent and that complexity and contradiction are phenomena of cognition, whereas ambivalence is a quality of perception. Thank you. of inner nature. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, I also just wanted to take a minute to, to thank um, especially Marina and Vittoria and Diana for um, for taking such good care of all of us while we're here and for also providing such a kind of provocative forum for, for discussion. Um, and I, and I want to ask your indulgence. I am at the end of a cold and I might need frequent watering stuff, so I'm, I'm hoping that that won't get in the way of um, what I have to say today. Um, the title of my paper is Proof of Life, The Autobiographical Impulse Made Manifest. If a burgeoning sense of human agency and a methodical construction of the self are indeed harbingers of mo modernity, then this paper will address the idea of the intimate metropolis through an examination of the construction of the self in Fantasy Ecla Brussels. Specifically, it will examine the two disparate modes of self-construction embodied in Victor Horta's Hotel Tassel and his Maison de Peuple. With regard to the construction and representation of the self, the Art Nouveau period boasts two firsts. Its architects were the first to publish autobiographies, most notably those of Victor Horta, Henry Vandevelde, and Louis Sullivan. 
and this period also produced the first aesthetic manifestos, um, those by the symbolists and the Belgian um, avant-garde group Les Vins um, are the ones that will be crucial to this particular narrative. I'm interested in the autobiography and the manifesto, not as mere literary or aesthetic genres, but as operative modes of self-representation. I will argue that the representational structure of the autobiography is operative in the Hotel Tassel, while the Maison de Peuple is a product of the representational structure of the manifesto. However, there appears to be a logical gap in the argument as I've laid it out thus far. Most of you know the architecture of the Art Nouveau period for its elaborate, um, some might even say excessive, vegetal ornamentation, um, for its depiction of generative natural motifs momentarily arrested. How do we make the conceptual leap from this very explicit representation of the natural to the idea of self-construction? To do so, we need to pose yet another question. What conception of the natural is the Art Nouveau representing? Underlying two of the greatest preoccupations of 19th century European culture, biology and autobiography, is a pervasive interest in bios, the course of a life or a lifetime. Vital to both biology, the science of life, and autobiography, the narrative of one's own life, is a curiosity concerning the course of life, which privileges the enduring over the incremental, the perpetually becoming over the perennially fragmented. Biology and the autobiography share with the Art Nouveau a conceptualization of the natural in its emergent or generative sense, often referred to as natura naturans. But it is not just nature's sense of emergence that biology, autobiography, and the Art Nouveau have in common. In all three, the natural is interiorized in the organism, the life, and the domestic interior, respectively. The conception of nature they share is one of inner nature. To return to the question of what conception of the natural the Art Nouveau is representing, I will focus today on the conflation of generative nature and interiority embodied in the category of inner nature. Inner nature is the territory in which the topography of the self and the horizon of the domestic interior intersect. I want to examine two disparate conceptual trajectories of the idea of inner nature, the first belonging to Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the second to Immanuel Kant. In Rousseau's formulation, inner nature does not manifest itself through the fixity of an image. Rather, it reveals itself through the fluidity of a voice. For him, the voice of inner nature is the source of all expression. Rousseau postulates that nature is like a voice within us, which speaks to us as our conscience. He writes, the inner voice is our mode of access, but we can lose contact with it. It can be stifled in us, and what can stifle it is precisely the dis disengaged stance of calculating reason, the view of nature from the outside as a merely observed order." End quote. These words encapsulate the romantic shift from the mimetic to the expressive representation of nature, so that finally for Rousseau, the only way to fully understand nature and its potential is to express what we find within ourselves. One of Rousseau's primary vehicles for the representation of inner nature as source is the autobiography. And three of his texts, Emile of um, 1762, The Confessions of 1771, and Rousseau, Judge of, Judge of Jean Jacques of 1772, fall under this general category. However, my interest in the autobiography is not as a literary genre, but as a mode of self-representation a vehicle of expression of the voice of inner nature. In this respect, I will examine the ideational lineage between Rousseau's writing and the expression of the voice of inner nature in Victor Horta's oeuvre, in the writings of his memoir, which he began in 1939, in the official purging of his archive in 1945, and in the creation of his built works. On the first page of his memoir, Horta encourages the reader to treat the text like a plan, not like a literary work. According to conventions of architectural representation, 
The plan imparts a sense of wholeness, organization, temporal sequence, and relational structure to the built work. It is a totalizing representation, and in this sense seems to be at the appropriate corollary to a literary work that literally depicts a lifetime. Horter writes in his memoir that architecture is the, quote, art in which the qualities that seem the most natural that one cannot see are able to exist, end quote. For Horta, both architecture and the autobiography structure the expression of the voice of inner nature. Now I'd like to turn um, to the second conceptual trajectory of the idea of inner nature. If in Rousseau's hands, the voice of inner nature was the source of all expression, in Kant's hands, the idea of inner nature becomes an autonomous prospect. Kant was so struck by the radical introspection and interiorization of nature in Rousseau's Emile that he equated the impact of its publication with that of the French Revolution. Paradoxically, it is Kant's formulation of the idea of inner nature as an autonomous, rational nature that actually attains this revolutionary status of cultural redefinition. In the foundation of the metaphysics of morals, Kant establishes the autonomy of inner nature when he writes first that rational nature exists as an end in itself, and later that man, and in general, every rational being exists as an end in himself, and not merely as a means to be arbitrarily used by this or that will. In all his actions, whether they are directed to himself or to other rational beings, he must always be regarded at the same time as an end." End quote. For Kant, to act morally is to act according to one's true nature as a rational being. This is what he calls freedom. Thus, his formulation of inner nature as rational nature gives rise to a concept of freedom as rational agency. Charles Taylor deems this idea a revolutionary force in modern civilization claiming that it offers a prospect of what he calls pure self-activity, where action is determined by my own agency as a formulator of rational law. Here I want to argue that the Kantian notions of an autonomous inner nature and a sense of pure agency or self-activity are crucial to the formulation of the modern manifesto. Further, I want to suggest that Rousseau's concept of inner nature facilitates style, or the appearance of cohesion due to a common source of expression, whereas Kant's idea of inner nature propagates movement, or the performance of autonomous actions by a group of people working towards a common goal. The Art Nouveau balanced precariously on this precipice between period styles and avant-garde movements. While Horta never actually wrote a manifesto, he was intricately involved with the Belgian avant-garde, and in 1896, Belgium's socialist party, the Parti Ouvrier Belge, commissioned him to design the Maison de Peuple. The inner na nature represented in this project is an autonomous, rational nature, greatly influenced by the work of Ville Le Duc. What is so interesting about Horta's socialist inclinations is that for him, they were not a learned ideology but an activation or manifestation of his own inner nature. Horta writes, my friends and I had the same idea without there ever being a question of personal interest involved. We were Reds without ever having thought of Marx. So to recap my argument thus far, um, I am tracing two disparate traje trajectories of the idea of inner nature. The first is Rousseau's conception of the voice of inner nature as the source of all expression. And this I link to the autobiographical mode of representation, which quite literally gives voice to the author's inner nature. The second is Kant's formulation of the autonomy of inner nature that ultimately engenders the manifesto as a mode of self-representation in which rational nature is the ground for moral action. Now I'd like to examine how the autobiography and manifesto as operative modes of representation are played out in Horta's work through the categories of inner nature, self-evidence, history, grammatical status, mode of operation, construction of a public, and locus. I'll start with inner nature. 
The Kantian notion of an autonomous, rational nature is evidence in the primus, I'm sorry, is evident in the primacy of the structural system of Horta's Maison de Peuple. Influenced by Viollet le Duc's principles of rational construction, Horta's drawings point to a fascination with the logic and intelligibility of the structural system. And it is this hermetic system that grants cohesion to the individual parts. In contrast, if the inner nature of the Maison de Peuple is rational, the inner nature of the Hotel Tassel is sentimental. And if the former achieves cohesion through its structural system, the latter achieves cohesion through style. Every surface of the Hotel Tassel seems to bear the imprint or, tr or tracery of a generative nature, a nature whose emergent properties are barely constrained by its material conditions. With the conception of nature as inner nature comes the conflation of man's inner nature, what Rousseau called conscience, but might more appropriately be referred to as the psyche in the context of the 19th century, with the domestic interior. The domestic interior becomes a palliative to the corrosive influences of urbanity. Its soothing colors and motifs of regenerative nature cultivating, conditioning, and rejuvenating its inhabitants. Next, I want to talk about the idea of self-evidence. If my larger argument is concerned with the manifesto and the autobiography as operative modes of self-representation, I'd like to raise the question of precisely what is being offered as self-evidence. The etymology of manifesto suggests that the term has its origin in a legal context, and specifically in the procedure for entering something into evidence. Subsequently, manifesto acquired its more pervasive meaning of a text that offers evidence for the private ma manipulation of public opinion. Perhaps this idea is most dramatically embodied in the Maison de Peuple's Salle de Spectacle. One end of this space is occupied by a stage uh, where films, plays, and invited speakers advance socialist ideology. On the opposite end, the rear wall is glazed. And as light pours through this enormous aperture, illuminating the space and its innovative structure, the space itself is transformed into a spectacle in which the tangible achievements of the ordinary worker take center stage. Self-evidence in the autobiography is complicated by the retrospective temporality of the enterprise. An autobiographer writes about a life lived. Like the operative fallacy of 19th century biology that consistently equated historical succession with causation, the autobiographer rarely resists the temptation to give meaning to the recounting of their lives' events. Porter designed the hotel tassel for Emile Tassel, a professor of descriptive geometry with a passionate interest in photography. I want to argue that by making descriptive geometry and photography performative in the hotel tassel, Porter renders these biographical details about Professor Tassel autobiographical. They give meaning to Emile Tassel's life each time they are experienced. Thus, Horta's use of descriptive geometry um, in the layout of the main stair, the production of the effect of the photographic negative in the fumoir stained glass, and the accommodation of the magic lantern projections through the rotating ironwork of the mezzanine balcony are all experiential evocations of Emile Tassel's life and interests. So here um, you can begin to see the stare and the way in which there was a kind of complex or a need because of the complexity of the form to employ descriptive geometry. Um, in the middle image here, what Horta actually did was to create a kind of a piece of ironwork that rotated. And the idea was that Professor Tassel and his um, close friends would be in this space above um, and that the, and the magic lantern would actually produce uh, project an image down into this um, space down here, which is the dining room of the house. Um, and the third example I talked about here is in the fumoir window. Um, and here Horta was extremely interested in the idea of the photo negative. And so 
um, what you're seeing is that on the um, lines on the interior, which appear to be white on the stained glass, when you look at those same lines on the exterior, it has a kind of photonegative effect. And I want to argue in each of these cases that it's, it's through the making of these things performative um, that, that this idea um, is carried through in the work. Next, I'd like to talk about history. As mentioned earlier, the Art Nouveau occupies the threshold between the succession of period styles and the advent of modern movements. In fact, the historiography of the Art Nouveau is, is neatly divided into two, two camps. And this is actually sort of extraordinary. Every piece of writing on the Art Nouveau systematically treats the historiography in one of these two ways. Those who see the style as historicism's last gasp and those who understand the movement as a harbinger of modernism. The manifesto introduces a burgeoning awareness of historical agency, and with that awareness, the belief that history is a, medi a medium to be actively shaped and manipulated. The conceit of the autobiography is that it substitutes personal history, or the inner world of subjective consciousness, for historical coherence. Thus, the choice of nature as source, even though it is understood as proto-historical, is just one more option in the morass of historical eclecticism. Now I'd like to talk about the category of grammatical status. The manifesto is a call to action and is an incitement a succinct text structured by a staccato of imperatives. Its grammatical analog is a verb. Similarly, the Maison de Peuple is a call to action. It is an invitation to interact with other workers and a solicitation to practice the ideology of socialism. The Salle de Spectacle articulates the ide ideology the tenets of socialism are made intelligible through speeches, plays, and films. In the cafe, the ideology is discussed and debated, and it is where socialists come to socialize. Um, in the numerous cooperatives, businesses owned jointly by all of their workers who share equally in the profits, soci socialist ideology is realized and practiced. Um, here, you can see some of the cooperative shops. Um, in this case, there were uh, this was there were, was a butcher and a grocer on this side of the Maison de Peuple, and on the other side there were cooperatives that were engaged directly with the fabric industry. So these were the kinds of um, shops that occupied the space, and then uh, of course the Salle de Spectacle here and the uh, cafe space uh, there on the end. If the grammatical analog of the manifesto is a verb, then the autobiography is simultaneously the subject and object. In his memoir, Horder refers to his adherence to the theory that the facade is the product of the interior. This would encourage a physiognomic interpretation of the tassel facade, in which the elevation is a portrait of the occupant an expression of the inner nature of Emile Tassel. Thus, programming the facade with Tassel's office, uh, which is here, his photographic studio and darkroom here, and his optics laboratory here, um, can be interpreted as, a, interpreted as a constructing of a public face at the very threshold of the intimate and the metropolitan. I want to talk a little bit about mode of operation. Not surprisingly, the mode of operation of the manifesto is manifestation. And in the Maison de Peuple, Horta explicitly referred to the cafe as the hall of manifestations. Extending the full width of the building with the front and rear facades comprised entirely of glazing, and you can see that here in the plan. The cafe is a public demonstration of the political efficacy of socialism, simultaneously a beacon, a display window, and an attractor. 
The autobiographical mode of operation is expression, in which the inner is pressed out as though by a force alien to us, in A.W. Schlegel's words. I'm particularly interested in, in this romantic allusion to an alien force as the cause of expression. In the vestibule of the Tassel House, the vi visitor is plunged into darkness, um, and any available ambient light reveals a motif of flames emanating from a central s source and licking across the floor, a tacit reminder of the role of fire in the evolution of the domestic setting. At the center of the flames is a heating grate, um, which forces warm air into the space through a system designed by Horta. In a sense, the system is used to activate the symbolic content of the mosaic. It is the alien force that facilitates expression. In Rousseau, judge of Jean-Jacques, Rousseau refers repeatedly to his body of autobi autobiographical writings as, quote, forming a coherent system, which n might not be true, but offered nothing contradictory, end quote. One such contradiction is to be found in the landing of the Tassel House, in which the mosaic of generative natural forms defers to the logic of the structural system. And here I'm talking about this interruption here. It is a locale in which the truth of inner nature being expressed is actually called into question. And here I think it's worth saying that this is a um, mot motif that happens consistently in Horta's work. And um, it's actually a funny permutation of, of Viollet Leduc's ideas of rational construction. And that is that Horta sort of takes on this idea of the expression of structure. Um, but in this case, there's obviously no structural reason here for an interruption. Um, it, what it becomes is a kind of projection of the structural system. Um, onto the floor. I mean, as you can see here, this is following the column structure, and it, it becomes a sort of surficial manifestation of, of structure um, and, and a way in which the symbolic content of the house is now at odds with the kind of structural system of the house. Uh, next, I want to talk about the, uh, the idea of constructing a public. The manifesto and the autobiography employ different methods for constructing a public. The manifesto engages in we speak. Um, I'm here borrowing Marianne Ka's term from her text on the manifesto. Constructing a public through implication, it is, it is a rhetorical device whose conceit is that it is always already preaching to the converted. Porta's involvement in this less than subtle form of persuasion is evident in this special edition of the socialist newspaper, Le Peuple, published in 1899 and dedicated exclusively to the Maison de Peuple. Four years earlier, he was featured in Petit Bleu um, in this caricature emphasizing architecture as a trade and Horta as a master builder. A propagandistic detail made more remarkable by the fact that at the same time he worked on this commission for the, um, for the Belgian Socialist Party, he was also designing a house for Van Eetveld, the personal advisor to King Leopold. The autobiography constructs its public through identification. It caters to the fundamental human curiosity about occupying another another's perspective or living in someone else's shoes. Through this intimate perspective, the public is privatized. It consists of every individual who can identify with the personal experience related. In the Hotel Tassel, amenities typically considered public are absorbed into the domestic interior. The public park becomes the winter garden. The place of worship transforms into Professor Tassel's bureau, um, complete with altar and stained glass window. And the cinema and theater morph into a magic lantern version of the home entertainment center. Now I want to talk about locus. 
The optimum locus for the manifesto is a public venue with a decisive horizon of domesticity. For example, a salon, and this has come up in, in Diana's and um, in a number of other presentations. Salon is one of a number of terms that emerge to describe the mutual appropriation and absorption of the public and private realms in this period. In his memoir, Horta describes the program of the Maison de Peuple, and here I want to quote at length because I think it's germane to this, as a house where there would be air and light, a luxury so long excluded from workers' slums, a house where there would be a place for administration, for cooperative offices, for offices for political and professional reunions, and a cafe where the consumptions would be in line with the aspirations of the leaders in their fight against alcoholism, which was so, still so inveterate in the people. Conference rooms to extend instruction, and most importantly, a huge meeting room for politics and the congresses of the party, and also for the musical and theatrical distraction of the members." End quote. The mutual appropriation of the public and private domains embodied in Horta's description is also evidenced by his willingness to deploy the same formal device. In this case, the composition of the facade in the Van Eetveld House and the Maison de Peuple. So here what I'm interested in is, the, is Horta's um, use of this formal technique where you can see that in this particular portion of the facade of the Van Eetveld House, there, there's no problem in, in sort of using the same formal motifs for, for facade composition. And I think that this is another example of, of this sort of mutual, mutually appropriative um, domain. The autobiography shares with the novel the locus of the domestic setting. In Hannah Arendt's terms, between the manifesto's horizon of domesticity and the paradigmatic domestic situation of the autobiography lurks the construction of the social, the territory of the intimate metropolis. Horta's use of oblique perspectives um, in these renderings of the Tassel House, a convention known as Sena Parangolo, and typically employed in set design, speaks to theater and theatricality as additional vehicles for the extension of the horizon of domesticity into the public realms. This paper began with a consideration of the natural from the vantage point of the personal in Rousseau and Kant's conceptualization of inner nature. It followed this ideational lineage into the Art Nouveau period and examined the autobiography and the manifesto as operative forms of representation which became the means for the mutual appropriation of the public and private realms, resulting in a uniquely intimate metropolis. In current architectural discourse, ideas of inner nature are increasingly considered in biomorphic terms, as the inward trajectory narrows from the personal categories of reason and emotion to the morphological categories of embryos and blobs. So by way of conclusion, I wanted to make a pitch um, for a possible sequel to this symposium um, and, and to say thank you very much to everyone who organized this. <laughs>